بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وإمامنا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى. We thank Him upon all conditions. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, his entire household, all his companions without exception. We ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى. to bless them all and to bless every single one of us and to grant us every form of goodness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this event from us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a meaningful change that will be positive and that will result in our entry into Jannah. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, it is an honor to be the opening speaker at this beautiful straight path convention here in Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur. At the same time, I'd like to take you back to the previous conventions of the straight path where we discussed various matters. We discussed paradise and I recall very clearly that every single one of us was given such a vivid description that we all felt and we still feel that we would like to be part of those who earn paradise through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now you and I know that on this path of goodness there will be obstacles. And this is why the choice was made to speak on the obstacles because we don't want to be on the path and suddenly find ourselves not getting to the destination. And this is why when we speak about the obstacles, it's important for us to know that as human beings, every one of us will come across these obstacles. So what I'm about to say today and the speech that I'm about to deliver is entitled the effect of sins, the evil effect that sins have. What I'm about to say is relevant to every one of us. And we do know that there are two types of sins, the major sins, the minor sins. From among the major sins, there are some known as Akbarul Kabair, which means the biggest of the big sins, the most major of the major sins. And then there are those that are not the most major, but they are sins. And at the same time, they are minor sins. If we continue committing minor sins, we would be getting the sin of a major sin. Because to continue committing a major sin is in fact, sorry, to continue committing a minor sin is in fact a major sin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and may He grant us steadfastness and strength. The recitation of the Qur'an that we heard a few moments ago at the beginning of the session was quite clear in that shaitan, shaitan's promise is made manifest in the Qur'an. Allah speaks about it in order to warn us. What is it that he wants from us? What is it that shaitan wants from us? He wants us to lose track of the destination. He wants us to think that this world is everything there is. There is nothing more than this world. And this is the problem that we all face. When we become too cozy and comfortable on a bed, we don't feel like getting up. I mean this morning, you know, seeing that Salatul Fajr or sunrise is just post 7 o'clock. Some people were here at 7 while others were busy sleeping. MashaAllah. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. It's difficult. But if you know you want to make it to a specific place at a specific time, you will make an effort because your destination is set out. Your goal is set out. Similarly, when it comes to Jannah, if it's the point of focus all the time throughout your lives, no matter how comfortable this world may seem for you, you would know that it's only temporary. So let's dive straight into this topic, the effects of sins. What happens when I commit sin? What happens when I commit sin? Now, before I even go ahead, let me tell you one more thing. And that is, we will hear a lot of these effects. And in our lives, we might even think that, okay, I am facing this problem. I am facing that problem. 
It could be because of the sins you are committing as a mu'min, as a believer. The first thing I need to do when something bad happens to me is ask myself, am I committing sin? Did you know that? The first thing I need to do when calamity strikes is ask myself, is there a problem with my link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is there something I could do regarding my link with Allah? Perhaps Allah is upset with me. That is a question, the first question that a believer will ask himself. But when it happens to others, the first thing that we are taught to tell them is don't worry, this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In their hearts, they may think that yes, perhaps Allah is upset with me. But for us, when we are talking to one another, we should try and remind each other at the point of calamity that this is only but a test from Allah. Be strong, turn to Allah, make a lot of istighfar. What is istighfar? Seeking forgiveness of Allah. Did you know that that is a key to paradise? Seeking forgiveness to Allah will make easy, will facilitate your entry into paradise. Remember that no matter what level you think you may be upon, always seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you seek a lot of forgiveness, it increases your chances of earning paradise through the mercy of Allah without Him looking at your deeds. And what is the difference? The difference is when you are about to enter Jannah, may Allah grant us Jannah through His mercy. A person might think, okay, I've done a lot of good deeds, I've given charity, I've read my salah, I've done everything I could, and now I'm going to go to paradise. And he doesn't realize that the weight of the deeds in the eyes of Allah is different from what we think. Let me give you an example. One day, there was a statement uttered by someone at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just a little statement to say someone is short, okay? And... The Prophet Sallallahu says, Wallahi, had this statement been dropped into the ocean in the form of ink, it would have changed the color of the entire ocean. Wow. Did you hear that? So we think it's light, and yet it's serious. Take a look at a verse of the Quran in Surah An You know, today we go around accusing people saying, oh, the two are having an affair. Perhaps these people committed adultery and so on. We speak in this way sometimes. Or did you hear the latest? You know, that's what people say. Did you hear the latest? What's the latest? Everyone wants to know what the latest is. Oh, do you know the gossip? And we start one after the other gossiping. Do you know what the Quran says? And I'm just going to read a portion of this verse in Surah An Nur. تَحْسَبُونَهُ هَيْنَهُ وَهُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَظِيمٌ You think it's something light, but yet in the eyes of Allah, it is something major. It is something big. So my brothers and sisters, let's be very careful. One of the first effects of sin is fear. You start fearing, you are worried. A person who's committed murder is worried. Worried that one day I'm going to be caught. Someone might have seen me. They might expose me on the internet. This might happen. Obviously, murder is a major sin. We're going to be speaking about it through this convention. But at the same time, even other sins, you become fearful. Why do you become fearful? Because you did not fear Allah. So Allah instills within you the fear of the creatures of Allah. Did you hear that? When you do not fear Allah, He makes you fear the rest of the people. Allahu Akbar. But if you are fearing Allah, the whole world, you will not be worried about it because you are calm, you are relaxed. There's nothing to worry about. Why? Because I was fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He creates the love in the hearts of the people for you because you were fearful of Him. So the first point is people become scared, fearful of what? The rest of humanity. Sometimes even fearful, what's going to happen to me now? Do you know when a person commits a sin, they've committed adultery, they've committed, for example, so many other sins, they become scared. What's going to happen to me? I'm waiting for a punishment. They know. But my brothers and sisters don't lose hope. You know, I'm a person and I'm sure you know that. I like to give you that branch, the olive branch. And I'd like to show you and tell you that the mercy of Allah is greater than that. So yes, we will be speaking of these effects. But don't let that sadden you because there is a door that is constantly open until the point of gargara, which means until the point where you're about to die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you with forgiveness if you seek forgiveness. So seek forgiveness and stop thinking what's going to happen to me now. Inshallah, nothing will happen. If Allah did not expose you while you were sinning, 
do you think he's going to expose you while you are seeking forgiveness? Or after you have sought forgiveness? And if he does, to a certain extent, it can only be for your good, my beloved brothers and sisters. Similarly, there is fear of a different nature. A person who gambles and a person who has engaged in that type of a sin, sometimes they can lose their property. They now become fearful. What's going to happen? You know, I've just lost all my money. Well, who told you to gamble? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all from sin. Similarly, point number two, the narrowing of the heart when a person sins and a person is in constant worry. One is fear and the other is worry. The heart is narrow. Why is it narrow? Because you don't feel good. There is something. You know, point number three is actually sadness. You feel sad. So you are worried and you, you are sad. You have the world. You might be a wealthy person, but you are so sad. Nothing makes you happy. Perhaps you are sinning. Maybe there is something you are doing against the instruction of Allah. That's why you are sad. A true believer does not become so sad and despondent. May Allah protect us. Yes, Allah tests us sometimes with tests. Now one might ask, I had a major issue that happened in my life. Say for example, someone's life was taken away who was dear to me. Is that a punishment? Is it the effect of my sin? Or is it a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I need to tell you something, something very interesting. The simple litmus test is ask yourself, what's my relation with Allah? If you are happy with the decree of Allah, then it is a test. A test in order to make you a better person. A test in order to draw you closer to Allah. A test in order to give you an opportunity to earn reward. Why? Because I know I'm trying my best to please Allah. This cannot be the punishment of Allah. You will be convinced when you are trying your best to please Allah, that what is happening to you in terms of negativity is definitely not the punishment of Allah. It cannot be. Why should Allah punish me when I'm trying to please Him, when I'm seeking forgiveness? وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ Allah will not punish them for as long as they are engaging in repentance. If you are seeking the forgiveness of Allah, remember what comes in your direction is not a punishment. It's just a test. And the test can be looking outwardly exactly the same as a punishment. Did you hear that? Outwardly, you might have lost things. You might have lost your house. You might have lost property. There could be robbers that came in and perhaps shot at you and perhaps harmed you. Your health might have deteriorated. You might have been diagnosed with a disease. It looks outwardly just the same. You don't know, is this calamity or is this test? But the condition of your heart will determine for you which one it is. Similarly, point number four, you feel very lonely. Allahu Akbar. A person who commits sin and does not repent from the sin, they have a loneliness in their heart. As much as they may be living in the midst of people, they feel alone. Alone meaning there's no one. No one understands me. No one knows me. No one really cares for me. No one bothers. Well, when you couldn't care for what Allah has instructed, then definitely Allah will create people who don't bother about you. They're not cared. They couldn't give a damn, so to speak. May Allah forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us strength. This is why my brothers and sisters, it's not worth sinning. These are the effects of sin. You get lonely. And I'm lonely because I don't have a link with Allah. You want to take that loneliness away? Develop your link with Allah. Get up late at night when everyone's fast asleep or very early in the morning when everyone is still asleep and start praising Allah and start thanking Him, and start communicating with Him, start talking to Him, you will find your heart blossom. You will find the comfort, even if you're living on your own. Subhanallah. There are people who live on their own, yet they don't feel lonely. And there are others who live in the midst of their entire family, but they are all alone. Allahu Akbar. May Allah forgive us. Similarly, things become difficult for you. As a result of the sins committed, things become difficult. Nothing seems to be working in my life. I went to look for a job, I didn't get it. I came out to walk, I couldn't catch, for example, a lift, or I couldn't 
You know, something went wrong. I walked in this direction, I became sick and ill. I went to that hospital, I spent all my money, but I'm still quite sick and ill. I went to this place here, I lost more. I came back home, I found myself going through a divorce. I went, I walked in the other direction, my children don't want to talk to me. Everything is going wrong. That could just be the effect of the sins you are engaging in. Develop a link with the owner of solution and you will find solutions to your problems. The difficulty with us, we think we're too clever sometimes. We think we're too clever sometimes. What happens? We think, okay, I've got these problems. Let me resolve them the way the globe, the way the secular world has taught me how to resolve them. Removing Allah from the equation, you're never going to have a true solution. You might have a temporary measure put in place, but it is not a true solution of your problems. The solution to your problems lies with the owner of solution. Who is he? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember this. So this is why my brothers and sisters, if everything becomes difficult, you feel like you are blocked and locked in to a condition and situation that you simply cannot come out of. Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. The one who is fearful of Allah, the one who is conscious of Allah, Allah grants them an opening and Allah sustains them from a direction that they did not imagine. Meaning Allah will look after them. When? When you are fearful of Allah, when you are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know of a person who went to Makkah to Al-Mukarrama and made a dua at the Kaaba and cried to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that dua was not given immediately, but it was given some time later. A few months later, they saw this thing happening. And it was a direct result of that dua. So they thought Allah did not respond my dua up to so many months later. Yet Allah heard the dua and replied it. But Allah said, perhaps that I have heard your dua. I'm responding to this dua. It is accepted already. But when the time is right, you will see the effect of it. So when the time was exactly right, that thing happened. Subhanallah. This is the verse where Allah says, whoever fears Allah, Allah will grant them a way out from their problem. Sometimes we are stuck. I'm sure it happens to all of us. Situation where you think, how am I going to get out of this? Can I tell you? Lots of istighfar. Turn to Allah. Read your Quran. Read your salah, your obligations unto Allah. Seek Allah's forgiveness like I said just now. Continue to seek Allah's forgiveness. Don't ever tell yourself. Why should I ask Allah's forgiveness when I haven't committed sin? Those statements are not uttered by a believer. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him used to seek forgiveness even though he was spotless, sinless. He used to say, Oh Allah forgive me. Oh Allah forgive me. Oh Allah grant me goodness. Oh Allah. Yet he had all the goodness. He still used to ask why to teach us that if you want goodness, seek the forgiveness of Allah. If you want your doors to open miraculously, seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the effects of sin is also that you become a person who doesn't want to engage in the other deeds that will please Allah. The other obligations upon a believer. For example, a man who drinks alcohol or a person who is taking drugs or for example, a person who is used to gambling. When it comes to time for salah, they will feel lazy. Automatically you've become lazy. Why am I so lazy? Because I'm not really connected to Allah the way I'm supposed to be. I'm doing other sins that are having an effect on my entire soul and my body. So I don't feel energetic when it comes to pleasing Allah. My energy is used to displease Allah. The same energy does not want to be used to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember this. So this is why when we are lazy to engage in that which Allah has instructed, look in yourself. Seek forgiveness of Allah. Engage in lots of istighfar. And please don't pay lip service to istighfar. I've spoken about this so many times in the past. Don't just say, Astaghfirullah, 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 without thinking of what it means and without thinking what you are saying. 
When you say it once with proper concentration, it's actually enough. The difficulty with us, we don't say it with concentration even when we've uttered it 100 times. We just say, Staffullah, 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 and we walk out. You know that? May Allah not do that to us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Make an effort, my brothers and sisters, to seek the forgiveness of Allah. Say istighfar. It will open all your doors. Trust me. Say istighfar. Ask Allah to forgive you. He will grant you sustenance to start with. So, like I was saying, we become lazy to engage in what Allah has instructed us to. You know, sometimes you have a wealthy person and Hajj is compulsory on him. But because of sins he's committing, he doesn't feel like going. He tells you, oh, there's a stampede there. And there is this, no matter what you say, it is just an excuse. Hajj is Hajj. If it is Farad, it is Farad. Inshallah, you will come back like everyone else. And if you don't, can there be a better place to pass away than the holy lands? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. Yesterday, someone sent me a message telling me that my relative passed away in Medina Munawwara. I said, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Masha Allah, tabarakallah. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, one is we are condoning, saying, you know, we're sorry, we are expressing condolences to say, you know what, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're going to return to Him. But secondly, I'm saying, mashallah, there couldn't have been a better place to die than the Holy Lands. So getting back to what I was saying, my brothers and sisters, when we are lazy to do something that Allah has instructed, we need to engage in istighfar. Go back, check your link with Allah, check the record, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's goodness. Another effect of sin is that we become shameless. When a person commits the first sin, he might feel shy. And after a while, other people commit sins. And then this person openly commits sins. This is why the hadith says, people will continue to remain in goodness. Remain in goodness meaning, there is hope for them. For as long as they do not openly commit sin. So if someone closes the door, they privately commit sin, it means they don't want to expose it. They are shy, they are ashamed. And they don't want to expose themselves. The hadith says, there is a greater chance of such, such a person achieving the forgiveness of Allah than there is for a person who openly commits it. You don't even bat an eyelid. People are committing adultery on the street and nobody even bats an eyelid. That is dangerous. So, the going away of modesty. إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاسْنَعْ مَا if you, don't, if you are not ashamed or if you don't have any modesty, you are not shy in any way, then you are going to do whatever you want, isn't it? Whether it's right or wrong doesn't bother you. My brothers and sisters, I tell you why this is such a dangerous crime. And it's such a dangerous effect of the crime that is committed in this way. Because we are encouraging others to do the same. You know, if you encourage people to sin, just like you are sinning, sometimes you might say, I didn't encourage them. The very fact that you committed the sin in public has already encouraged them. That's what it is. Why do you want your name to go down in the books? That you were a person who taught people how to sin. Why, doesn't, why don't you think for a moment that I'm going to die, rather leave a legacy whereby my name goes down, that I am going to be, I'm a person who actually taught people how to do good. And the sins I had, and we are all sinful by the way, we all commit sins on different levels. None of us can say we are perfect, but... We are talking of the effects so that by listening to them, we feel like turning back. That's the idea. When I listen to the effect of sins and I start thinking to myself, you know what, perhaps this, perhaps that. What will I do? I will start searching in my soul for where I've gone wrong. And I will start correcting myself and I will change my life. That's the idea. This is why all this is spoken about either in the Quran or in the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, it's actually a gift of Allah that we are being taught this. May Allah make things easy for us. Let's not commit sin in public. Let's not be people who are shameless. And if we find ourselves being shameless, and we realize it, perhaps it would be a bonus in the sense that we would be able to leave that, quit it, and go back to modesty. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. 
Then there is a very sad effect of sin. And that is, one sin leads to another. The effect of one would lead to another. So it is not easy to just say, you know what, I will just do this once and then it's over. You do it once, you know what, you're going to scratch your head and say, I want it again. And then you're going to scratch your head and say, I want to go back. And then you're going to scratch your head and say, okay, that's not satisfying me anymore. I now need to go into something else. That's how shaitan works. He lures you by telling you the first time, don't worry, it's just once. You're just going to commit a sin one time. That's it. No more. I'm not going to do this again. And, and then you commit it and you tell yourself, not again. And sometime later, shaitan comes to you and says, wasn't it nice? Didn't you enjoy yourself? Oh, what, for two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes? I mean, you went to drink alcohol one evening, one night, perhaps you had in the club and whatever happened, happened there and so on. And then you made your tawbah and then shaitan comes and says, hey, wouldn't you like to go again? Come, go again, you know? And then you think to yourself, oh, okay, one more time, one more time. You notice the first, it was one time. Now what is it? One more time. Did you notice that? One time and then one more time. And that one more time is unlimited, which means you can keep on saying that until you die, it will still be one more time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah strengthen us. Know the trap of the devil. Understand the trap of shaitan. That's how he wants to entrap you. So whatever's happened in the past, we put an end to it. Khalas. It's over. I don't want to do it. Not once more and not twice more. Nothing. So like I was saying, one sin leads to another. And sometimes it becomes so big. And I can let you in on something else. The first time a person commits a sin, yes, he will ask Allah's forgiveness, he will feel very bad, he will feel, you know what, this is terrible. You feel the effect, it has a powerful punch on your heart, powerful punch, or your soul, or let's say your spirituality. That punch was felt such that you didn't sleep, you cry to Allah. When you commit a sin again, it becomes cheap. Cheap meaning, you know what? No, it's okay. I committed it once. The second time was slightly easier. If you don't block yourself powerfully from committing it a second, a third, a fourth, by the time you get to four or five times, it becomes a habit such that now you removed Allah from the equation totally. No more. I can commit a sin without batting an eyelid. I don't even remember that Allah exists while I'm doing all this. I've forgotten about it. This is why the hadith speaks of the importance of fulfilling salah upon its time. You always in wudu. When you are in wudu, which means you are clean, you will not want to sin. You know, hey, I'm going to commit a sin, but then I'm going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the evil effects of sin is you don't get any joy from the acts of worship you're engaging in. So you will read salah Allahu Akbar on Jumu'ah just because everyone else is doing it and they need to see you there because you're a Muslim. That's it. So I said, Allahu Akbar, and I'm standing and I'm thinking, hey, the sound is too loud, the light is not so good, you know, okay, this guy is taking a little bit too long with the recitation, ooh, that guy is playing with a mobile phone, and so on. What am I doing? And then Allahu Akbar, oh, sorry, I need to go down. Was that salah? Why? Why can I not concentrate at all? Perhaps you are engaging in sin. So you lost concentration completely. Perhaps there is some, perhaps, why am I using the word perhaps? Because it's not always the case. But you need to ask yourself, what am I doing? So you lose concentration and you don't enjoy these acts of worship anymore. You give out a charity simply because, okay, I could, I gave it out. But there is no respect of that poor person. You know, when you give a charity, you respect the person you are giving it to. Respect. You pray for them as well. Not just to say, oh Allah, okay, I got this done. It's over with it. That's it. No, there is more to it than just that. The heart becomes hardened. When a person continues to engage in sin, that's another effect. The heart becomes hardened in the sense that a person's heart normally softens up to a message. When someone is reminded of the Quran and the Sunnah and is told about what Allah wants them to do and does not want them to do, their heart is automatically softened. Look, mashallah, we are here in great numbers. Why? To please Allah. We want a message that will quench our spiritual thirst. Correct? So if a person doesn't even bother, you know, you see that, okay, mashallah, there's going to be a beautiful convention here. It's all about talk, you know, getting close to Allah. I'm available, but it's okay. Give it a miss. Too expensive. You know, I can't. 
Wallahi, if Nicki Minaj was here, people would pay a thousand ringgits. It's a reality. A thousand ringgits. I'm giving you a fact. Sometimes it's just to cover costs. That's what it is. Do you know why? When it comes to religious conventions, the donations that are just like that are minimum, if any at all. So how to cover the cost? People say, why are there no programs? Well, when they want to cover the cost, you're not prepared to even pay 20 ringgits. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So sometimes the effect of sin makes us look at good things as bad and bad things as good. So our mind is knocked. We don't understand. The understanding is snatched by Allah because you didn't want to understand the reality of revelation. When you refuse to understand what Allah reveals, Allah takes away your understanding on matters regarding the dunya. This is why today across the globe, you find so many people who speak a whole load of nonsense and yet they are given a top platform. And they speak that which doesn't make sense from a very high level of authority sometimes. It doesn't make sense at all. And you think to yourself, but how come they can't tell that one plus one is actually two? Well, the reason they cannot tell is because they don't want to understand revelation or anything to do with Allah. Where is Allah going to give them an understanding regarding the dunya, regarding this worldly life? So these are so many factors that we need to take into consideration. When there is a heart that is hardened, it, it is not touched by a good word. Like I always say, are you going to change your life today? Well, if you are, alhamdulillah, change it here and now. Don't ever tell yourself, you know, there's less than a hundred days left for Ramadan, inshallah. This Ramadan, then I'm going to stop. So for a hundred days, I can party. No way. Don't think that way. You don't know, you may not see that Ramadan. A winner is he or she who says, that's it. Right here, right now. Oh Allah, I promise you. That's it. Done. Then you succeed. So are we all going to make promises to Allah? I heard about three yeses, mashallah. Are we all going to make promises to Allah? Yes. Alhamdulillah. Let's become better people. Wallahi. And you will find these effects, the bad effects, we won't have them in our lives. When we go through negativity, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test every single one of us. But those will remain tests. We will still be happy with a smile. Haven't you seen people who are struggling sometimes in countries like Syria and Afghanistan and Pakistan and so many other places and they are struggling and suffering, but they are smiling. They are so happy. What did you eat today? Oh, I had rice. Wow, rice, plain rice. But I had rice a little. And we have the roasted chicken and the chips and the burgers and what else. And we are like, I just had a burger. <laughs> Relax. They were smiling when they had rice. And you are so upset when you had something much more expensive. There's something wrong here. Where is the contentment? Where did your contentment go? That's another point. You lose contentment and happiness because there are sins that are being committed one after the other and you don't even know. May Allah strengthen us. Look at those people who hear one verse of the Quran and it changes their whole life. What about us? We hear the entire Quran. It doesn't even have an impact on us. We just say, wow, beautiful recitation. And we go back straight into the nightclub. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. In fact, I can even say it in a more realistic way. We are going in our vehicles to commit a sin. And we are playing the Quran. You know that? It happens. We are going in our vehicles to commit a sin. We are playing the Quran. How? What's going on here? This shows that your heart is hard. It's the word of Allah being played, telling you not to commit the same sin you are on your way to committing, but you're not interested. You're just worried about the melody. I'm a Muslim, by the way, by the way, and I'm going to listen to the Quran, by the way, and so on. It's all by the way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Then when a person keeps on committing sin, there is another effect. What is it? Their resolve to seek the forgiveness of Allah becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. So you seek forgiveness sometimes, right? We seek forgiveness daily sometimes. Then you commit a sin, it knocks you. You don't feel like engaging in the acts of worship like I mentioned a little bit earlier. And then what happens? You say, okay, I will make tawbah. I will make it. When? I will. You know that word will <laughs> is loose-ended. You don't know when. I will. 
I am is what you're supposed to say. I am asking Allah's forgiveness here and now. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى Whoever turns away from our reminder, from our revelation, whoever turns away from the instruction of Allah, the first thing we do to them is we give them a life that is very narrow. No matter how broad it may be, it's very narrow for them. Everything seems negative. Even the most positive of things, you look at them as negative. So Allah says, you have a life that is dhunk. You know, it's, it's actually very, very sad, depressed, and at the same time, narrow. It feels like you don't want to live anymore. Why? Because you've turned away from Allah. So if this is happening because you've turned away from Allah, you need to do something about it. And Allah says on the day of judgment, we will resurrect them blind. The verse continues to say, the person will say, Oh Allah, I could see in the world, why am I blind now? And Allah says, you turned a blind eye to our revelation. So today you are blind. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not do that to us. Then we have a very dangerous effect and that is where Allah leaves you. Imagine, Allah loves everyone. But there comes a stage where a person continues to engage in serious major sin, one after the other. So Allah says, he's forgotten me totally, I'm going to forget him. Forget him not in the sense that Allah doesn't know about you and doesn't know you, but he doesn't have mercy on you anymore. Until you turn back to him. Because now you've got to a stage where you're sinning one after the other for a long time. The minute you say a word that is positive, you find the mercy of Allah coming back to you. One word. They say, even if you say Allah, Allah, you know, even by error, Allahu Akbar, may Allah grant us goodness. Even by error, it will help you. Why? Because that's the name of Allah. I'm sure you're aware of a hadith where it is said that on the day of judgment, a man will come forth and his deeds will be brought to the scale and there will be 99 files, all these files full of sin. And suddenly when they put it on the scale, the scales are about to tip towards the evil and one card actually falls out of one of those files. Each file from the east to the west filled with sin, 99 files. I don't think we can commit that type of sin, but... May Allah grant us a lesson. When the card drops, the angels are told to pick the card up. It has on it, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Once in his life, he uttered that word, the statement. And it is put on the right side of the scale. And guess what? The hadith says, it tips the scale. Completely. It tips it. How many of us have deeds that we have? That we hope on the day of judgment they will come to tip the scale. May Allah help us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really assist us and help us. You don't want Allah to leave you. One might wonder, how can Allah who is so merciful leave us? Well, listen to what he says. وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ Don't be like those who forgot Allah. So Allah made them forget themselves. And in another verse, Allah says, Nasullaha fanasiyahum, regarding the hypocrites. They forgot Allah, so Allah left them alone. <laughs> Carry on, do your thing. The hadith says, when you walk towards Allah, Allah rushes towards you. When you rush towards Allah, Allah comes to you even quicker than that. When you try to get closer to Allah, a hand span, He gets closer to you a whole foot, and so on. But when you're not trying to get close to Allah, you're walking away. What do you want from Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are walking away from Allah, and you still expect the mercy of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why when a person is walking away from Allah, and a lot of good things happen to this person, those are actually part of the punishment of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it. He says, 
فلما نسوا ما ذكروا به فتحنا عليهم أبواب كل شيء A certain group of people, when they had forgotten Allah, when they forgot what they were reminded about, when they forgot revelation, Allah says, we opened their doors, all of their doors, one after the other. They got a lot. Why did they get a lot? Allah says, when they were indulging now in everything we gave them in terms of the comfort of this world, we then punished them suddenly. May Allah not do that to us. This is why when you get things, it doesn't mean Allah is happy with you. And when things get go away from you, it doesn't mean Allah is angry with you. And vice versa. It all depends on your link with Allah. Which, in which direction are you walking? That's a question you ask yourself. Am I getting closer to Allah or am I moving further away from Allah? Why I say this is none of us is perfect. We're all going to try. We're all going to try and seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But... Every day we would be improving inch by inch. Some of us centimeter, some of us millimeter, some of us a whole meter at a time. We're not worried about the pace. We're worried about the fact that we are getting closer to Allah as the days pass. Yes, it would be a bonus if the pace was stepped up a bit. You know when you're driving a vehicle and you know you want to go from Kuala Lumpur to Penang. Let me give you that example since we are here. I will just catch a flight. But anyway, if you are driving, <laughs> if you are driving and imagine you're just moving at uh, 40 kilometers an hour and the road is open. Everyone wants to go 60, 80, 100, 120, 140, 160. And you keep on looking, hey, where's the speed traps? You know, we want to go because the reason is I want to get to my destination. The road is empty and it's open and it's, Wallahi, the road to Jannah is a highway. Beautiful. Don't just go millimeter by millimeter, centimeter. Try your best meter by meter. I want to cruise, man. I want to straight through. Alhamdulillah. How do you do that? Do good. When you do good to yourself, Allah will inspire you to truly, sincerely do good to others. You know, sometimes we do good to others just because we want to be seen to do goodness. No. When we do goodness to others, it's okay if people saw it. No problem. For as long as within your heart, you did it for the pleasure of Allah. To reach out to the rest of the creatures of Allah. You feel a genuine feeling towards others. When you're engaged in sin, you become selfish. That's another effect of sin. Why selfish? It's all about you. I want myself, me, myself. You forget about everyone else. That's nothing. I need it for myself. You see something, I want it. You see this, I want it. Everything you want. Why? I want, I want. No. Think about giving others as well. Then we have another very, very interesting point as well. Effect of sin. I start off by mentioning this in the Arabic language. Inna rajula la yuharamu rizqu bil dhambi yusibuhu. It's a hadith in Musnad al-Imam Ahmad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds back the sustenance of a person who's engaging in sin. That's the hadith. Rizq. Your rizq is held back because of a sin you are committing. Quit the sin and when Allah is happy, He will give you that rizq. So don't think that I have a lot, let me sin. No. You have a lot, you sin, Allah holds it back. Allah takes back your rizq. Imagine the hadith says a person's rizq is held back by Allah because of a sin he or she is committing. Don't do that. This is why the verse I read earlier also shows us that when you seek Allah's forgiveness, He will grant you sustenance. He will give you a lot. If I want sustenance, what do I do? I need to ask Allah's forgiveness. Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive me. Do it a hundred times a day and you find you get your sustenance. What does sustenance mean? It means there will be barakah and blessing in what Allah gives you. He will give it to you and on top of that, He will give you barakah. Imagine a person has so much, but there's no barakah. No blessing. One of the effects of sin is the barakah is snatched away. The blessing is snatched away. I had a hundred thousand ringgit. It's gone. Where did it go? I tell you, there are some sins perhaps you are committing. The money is gone. But some other person, I had five thousand ringgit. And you know what? MashaAllah, I still have three left. It happens. 
The barakah in what you purchase. Sometimes you purchase an expensive vehicle and in no time you're fixing it and taking it to the, to the service station and doing this and doing that. You know, we buy a car in order for the car to service us, but rather we become people who service the car. That's what happens. That's a punishment. That is actually sometimes a punishment. Sell the car and say Bismillah the next time you buy a car. That's the thing. Because then some people buy a cheap car. I've, I've bought a Toyota, a little Corolla, mashallah. And you know what? I keep rolling with it. That's why they call it Corolla, mashallah. <laughs> keep rolling. It's done 120,000 kilometers and I'm still rolling, mashallah. And we service it once in a while, a few dollars here and there, and that's it. May Allah forgive us. May Allah still grant me barakah in that vehicle of mine. But at the same time, my brothers and sisters, the point being raised is baraka. I'm sure we've understood it to say you might buy something cheap and it's so, so beautiful. It serves the purpose. It makes you happy. It's durable. It lasts. And sometimes you buy something very expensive and you know what? It didn't last. And don't fool yourself to say it's still under guarantee, under warranty. Let me go back. No. The point being raised is just turn to Allah. Make dua to Allah. When you select things, when you say things, relate that to Allah. Allah gave you, so say, Bismillah. Oh Allah, I'm about to purchase something expensive. You know, we purchase a house. It's not cheap. It's expensive. And we buy a house and after we've gone into the house, everything goes wrong. And we start thinking to ourselves, someone did magic on me. You know, that's the first point of stopping, isn't it? So people are jealous. I bought a house. Oh, look what's happening to me. Jealous, jealous. You look at your best friend, jealous. Look at your mother, you're jealous. Everyone's jealous. Nobody's jealous. You are jealous of yourself. You haven't even read Salatul Fajr in the same house. And you want barakah in that house? Come on. As-salatu khayrum minan naum. I'm sure we've heard that so many times. Amazing. So this is where the effect of sin comes in. Then there is another effect of sin. And that is, you forget everything that is beneficial in terms of knowledge. So I knew Surah Al-Fatiha, I knew this, I knew that, and I start forgetting things. Why? Because ilm, al-ilm nurun. Ilm is a light. And that light is snatched away from the one who perpetrates sin without turning back to Allah. So if you want to remember what you are taught, you want to have a better memory when it comes to the knowledge of the deen. Remember to seek the forgiveness of Allah. Lots of istighfar is a bonus. It's like when you want the iron to be absorbed, you need some vitamin C. Without vitamin C, your iron is not going to be absorbed. Just an example. So what happens? You have the two of them. So you want that knowledge to be absorbed? Seek Allah's forgiveness. May Allah forgive me. Say that many times. May Allah forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive my sins. Oh Allah, forgive my shortcomings. That which I know, that which I don't know. What I've done that is major. What I've done that is minor. What is major requires specific tawbah. What does that mean? That means I need to mention what I did to Allah alone. We don't confess to human beings at all. You confess to Allah alone. Oh Allah, you know what I did. I'm admitting my sin. You don't have to say it, but at least you know. You know my sin. I've committed the sin. I regret it. I won't do it again. And I'm going to turn to you, O Allah. Right now, forever. Allah forgives you. Shaitan's plan is he comes back to you and says, No, you're not forgiven. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Your sin was too bad. No way. My sin was forgiven. Imagine if you could see Shaitan and he's telling you, rather than just putting waswasa and just whispers in your mind if he was there physically and he was telling you, and you were talking to him and he says, no, you're, you're a right off, come on, you, you, you can't. You think you're just going to get away with it by saying, oh Allah, forgive me and Allah's forgiven you? No way. It's worse than that. And then what happens? You start committing another sin because you think to yourself, as it is, I'm going to Jahannam. So anyway, let me just book a better spot then, you know. Astaghfirullah. Let me book a better spot then. Now that I'm going to go there, I'd rather have a bigger place. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. That is bad. Tell the devil that is whispering in your mind, Allah has forgiven me. Use the past tense. Be convinced when you have sought Allah's forgiveness that you are forgiven. Not once did Allah say he will reject the tawbah. 
of a person who seeks forgiveness. Have you ever seen that anywhere in the Quran or in the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu that Allah says, "Man taba lam yatu billahu alayhi." Whoever seeks forgiveness, Allah won't forgive him. Did Allah? Did you ever come across that ever, even once? Never. The Hadith says, "Man taba taba Allahu alayhi." Whoever seeks Allah's forgiveness, Allah forgives them. <laughs> as simple as that. So don't lose mercy, hope in the mercy of Allah. When you say, oh Allah, forgive me. Remember, you are forgiven. Yes, there are four conditions. What are they? Admit your sin, seek the forgiveness, regret that sin, and promise not to do it again. That's it. So the question everyone asks all the time is, what if I end up doing it again? Well, if you, at the time of the tawbah, was genuine, Later on, shaitan came back to you and deviated you. For as long as you were genuine at the time of seeking forgiveness, you will be forgiven. And you will be forgiven again and again. Why? Allah knows that you are acknowledging, Oh Allah, you are my Rabb. Let me quickly explain that to you, just to give you some hope. When you are saying, Oh Allah, forgive me, what are you doing? You are acknowledging Allah is your Rabb, He's higher than you, He is your owner. Then you made a mistake after six months or something, you fell into the same sin again. And then you came back crying and you said, Oh Allah, forgive me. Allah loves you. Why? He loves you because He granted you the acceptance to seek forgiveness. There are other people who don't seek forgiveness. We spoke about that. And secondly, Allah knows that you are acknowledging the status of Allah, that He is the owner of forgiveness. I did it again. I know the only hope I have is you. So Allah forgives you again. And you commit it a third time. Do you know what one narration says after the third seeking of forgiveness? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angels, عَلِمَ عَبْدِي أَنَّ لَهُ رَبًّا يَأْخُذُ بِالذَّنْبِ وَيَغْفِرُهُ أُشْهِدُكُمْ أَنِّي غَفَرْتُ لَهُ Look at my worshipper. He now knows that he has a Lord who can forgive him or punish him. I make you bear witness that I've forgiven him. Did you hear that? What type of hope? Islam is a religion of hope. It's amazing, subhanallah. Then one of the evil effects of sin is the fact that we are prohibited from the dua of the angels for us. From the dua of the Prophet peace be upon him for us. The Prophet peace be upon him made dua for the believers, for those who do good deeds. When you do evil deeds, you come out of that. Allah makes mention of this in the Quran that the angels, they seek the forgiveness for those who are seeking forgiveness. And they tell Allah, Oh Allah, forgive them. الَّذِينَ يَحْمِلُونَ الْعَرْشَ وَمَنْ حَوْلَهُ يُسَبِّحُونَ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّهِمْ وَيُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ وَيَسْتَغْفِرُونَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا وَسِعْتَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ رَحْمَةً وَعِلْمًا فَاغْفِرْ لِلَّذِينَ تَابُوا وَاتَّبَعُوا سَبِيلَكَ those who angels who are the, known as Hamalatul Arsh, the carriers of the Arsh. What are they saying to Allah? They are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yusabbihuna bihamdi rabbihim. They believe in Allah and they are seeking forgiveness for those on earth. Or they are seeking forgiveness for the believers who are turning to Allah. What are they saying? Oh Allah. You have encompassed everything with your mercy and with your knowledge. So forgive those who are seeking forgiveness. The angels are telling Allah, Oh Allah, forgive those on earth who are seeking your forgiveness. And those who are trying to follow your path, forgive them, Ya Allah. Amazing. Surely I want to be from among those. When I say Astaghfirullah, I know there are some angels saying, Oh Allah, forgive him. He's asking for forgiveness. And I'm happy. I'm so happy. There are angels actually asking on my behalf to Allah. It's in the Quran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us strength. Then one of the evil effects of sin is that your good deeds that you may have done in the past, they begin to become distributed among those whom you have wronged. And this is especially... When you commit sin against others, you want to backbite, you want to gossip and so on. Those are dangerous crimes. What happens? Your salah, your zakah, your hajj, your tilawah of the Quran and everything else, the reward of it is now given away to other people. Why should I do that? 
I need to protect it. So let me not sin against others as well. That is one of the evil effects of sin. Then I have two more points to make mention of. The first is that the real punishment of Allah descends upon those who deserve it. If you take a careful look at people who sin today, may Allah forgive us all and strengthen us, you will find that Allah sent messengers specialized. Each one was specialized to tell his people about one particular sin or two. So you have, for example, Shu'aib alayhi salam. He told his people about cheating in business, shortchanging people, and so on. You find, for example, uh, the, the other messengers, Nuh alayhi salatu was salam, what he spoke about. Lut alayhi salatu was salam, what he spoke about. And now you find in this ummah, people are engaging in all these sins one after the other. And they have been instructed by Allah to fulfill a certain command. When they don't fulfill that command and they engage in all of these sins, they need to go back and search how Allah punished those who committed those sins and did not turn. When you turn, you will be forgiven. All those who were called by the messengers, do you know what they were told? They were told that, turn to Allah, you will be forgiven. They were given a chance. The people of Nuh alayhi salam were given 950 years. Allah never ever comes to you and punishes you without giving you a moment or a chance. Allah gives you chances. One after the other, a thousand, a million chances. He gives you every breath is a chance. 136,000 heartbeats a day. Every one of them is a chance. Imagine Allah saying, hey, seek forgiveness. You know what? This heartbeat is going to stop one day. It's going to stop. So what type of punishment came to them? Allah says, so many different things. They had earthquakes. They were eaten by tremors. They, were, they had rain of stone that affected them. They had, you know, they drowned and so on. Different types of punishments. Allah destroyed them in different ways. We don't want that to happen to us. This does not mean that whenever you see a flood, suddenly say, yeah, adab, adab of Allah. You know, the last time there was a tsunami, some people said, why must I help? That's adab of Allah. It's a punishment of Allah. Well, when it happens in your area, then what will happen? The rest of the world will also say punishment of Allah. Were you with the gatekeepers of hell to know that this was part of the hellfire? Where were you? How do you know that this is the punishment of Allah? Like we said, it looks similar outwardly, but it's not. For some people, it's a mercy of Allah. For some people, it's a test. For some people, it's the punishment. But we as outsiders should always give hope to others and tell them, no, no, no. This was a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we will reach out to them. A person who suffers in a car accident and broke his bones, we will never ever look at them and say, oh, you deserved it. That was a punishment of Allah. You know, you must have done something wrong. Have you ever walked into a nightclub? Have you ever walked into a nightclub with these legs of yours? Once. Oh, that's it. Khalas. That was it. I know why it went. I know. How can you talk like this? If they sought the forgiveness of Allah once, that thing was wiped out. Who are you to ask someone, have you sinned before? Who are you to ask someone, have you sinned before? You don't need to know. That's my history. Who am I now? That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at. So that's what we should all look at. And the last point is, everyone wants to have a good death, right? Everyone wants to have a good death with shahada on the lips or in a nice place. Am I right? May Allah grant us a good death. We all have to go. So may Allah make it a day of goodness. We all want a blessed day, a blessed time. We want a blessed place. How can we get that? The chances of getting that are reduced when we engage in sin. Why are they reduced? Because you might just die committing that sin and it's over. So if you want to increase the chances of you having a good death, quit the sin and seek the forgiveness of Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. I hope and I pray that this talk has motivated us to actually become people who are closer to Allah, to look into ourselves. In no way did I intend to doom anyone. I tried my best to give everyone hope, 
while addressing this very important matter and very important subject i hope and i pray that we've taken notes and at the same time that we look into our lives and seek ways of getting gaining closeness to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may allah forgive us all wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina muhammad subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk